Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I believe God has got a word for you today. A word that's going to lift you up, it's going to encourage you, and set you free. I want you to stay tuned after this word, and we're going to come back and pray with you and believe God to move anything in your life. And if you need to give your heart to Jesus, we're going to pray with you to do that as well. So stay tuned and be blessed. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. How many's tired of religion? Hallelujah. I've been wanting to do that song, and I thought it fit with uh, what God was doing today. But uh, sometimes I just got to get to the king, get past all the, the junk. Hallelujah. The stuff that doesn't matter. Just get to his feet. Hallelujah. Amen. If you have your Bibles um, and you want to look with us, um, and uh, and we're going to be in Psalm 63. And once you find it, if you want to stand, uh, we'll uh, honor the reading of the word this morning. Hallelujah. Or you can look on the screen. <coughs> Psalms chapter 63. The Lord led me into this Psalms this week um, and uh, began to speak to me uh, a word I believe that I want to release to this house. It may deal with what you're going through today, um, but I believe God's going to do something in this house for the remainder of the service. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalms chapter 63, looking at verses 1 through 7, almost the whole chapter, but not quite. It says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name, and my soul shall be satisfied as with morrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been mine help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Woo, hallelujah. I want to talk to you today from the subject conquering your wilderness seasons. Conquering your wilderness seasons. Father, in the name of Jesus, let this anointing that's already been in this house, that's in this place even now, God, let it continue to flow through this vessel of clay. Think through our minds, speak through our lips. We bind every demon on assignment to hinder your word today. God, give us strength in our body, Lord God. And God, restore us, heal us as we preach, Lord God. And God, we're going to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, this psalm of, of David, you just have to excuse me. <coughs> I may do a little bit of coughing through this. But this psalm of David here was written, I believe, um, in a time when David was in the wilderness of Judea because of his son Absalom's rebellion. A lot of scholars go back and forth uh, between whether it was during the Saul years when he was running from Saul before he became king or if it was during his reign as king when Absalom, his son, uh, rebelled against him 
and turned much of the kingdom against him. I believe it was during his son Absalom's rebellion. Um, there's reasons I believe that, uh, but that's how I'm going to preach it this morning. Uh, when you preach it, you can preach it whichever way you want to preach it. But today, since I'm preaching, this is how we're going to preach it. Uh, because I believe it was during the time of Absalom's rebellion uh, that David was in the wilderness. Because during that time, uh, Absalom had turned so many of the hearts of the people of Israel against the leadership of David that it got to a point that David began to fear his own life. He began to fear um, assassination. And so it forced him out of the comforts of the palace. It forced him uh, really out of his routine of worship. And I want to and I, I really want to focus on that today. It, it forced him out of his routine of, of going uh, to the sanctuary. And, and, we, and we see that in a couple of the verses. But the Lord began to talk to me uh, about a spirit of Absalom. A spirit of Absalom. And what that is, is that's a spirit that will often work in our lives to bring circumstances that force us into a wilderness season like David or a season where we're forced out of uh, certain uh, routines of worshiping God and seeking God and certain comforts of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Uh, and, you know, we always want it to be easy to serve God. We always want things to be lined up just right, and we always want things to be working out a certain way for us to really worship. But sometimes you've got to do it in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Sometimes you've got to worship where it's not comfortable to worship, but you worship anyway. And that's sort of what this psalm is all about. And what I want you to notice in this psalm is I want you to notice David's heart in this season. This season of his son turning on him. Think about that. His own son turning on him and wanting to assassinate him and, and get him off the throne. His own son turned on him. It was a season of backstabbing by his own son. It was a season where his life and the throne that he, uh, God had brought him to was being threatened. And it, and it was a season where everything that God had brought him into looked like as though it could all be lost. It was a season where all of his comforts was gone. His, his routine of going to the sanctuary was disturbed. But I want you to notice David's heart in this season because if you can get a heart like David... You'll conquer these kinds of season where, the, uh, where the, the spirit of the enemy will come in and begin to shake things and disturb things and sort of, and sort of put you in a place where uh, what you were used to, maybe what you were comfortable with, your routine, everything's been disturbed and it's not like it was. You can conquer that season and you can still worship. If you can see David's heart in this, and I want to preach that to you today. Look in Psalms 63. Go back into verse 1, 1 and 2. Reminds you what it says. Oh, God, David said, thou art my God. He said, early will I seek thee. He said, my soul, that's my mind, my will, my emotions. They thirst for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. My flesh, that's, that's, that's weird. Well, not really. If you go to a Pentecostal church, even your flesh will long for God because how many knows that your physical body will receive and experience the power and the presence of God? Hallelujah. And there's things that happen in the, in the presence of God in your flesh. And your flesh begins to long to be in the presence of God. You long to be there physically. Come on, not just mentally and emotionally, hallelujah. But he says, 
My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see your power and your glory so as I've seen thee in the sanctuary. Notice that this psalm doesn't start off with David complaining about his son, David complaining about what happened to him. Notice he's not complaining about the wilderness. When he's mentioning a dry and thirsty land, that wasn't even talking about the wilderness. That was talking about not being able to be at church. Do you understand what David's complaint was when he starts off this psalm? His, plain, his complaint was this, I can't go to church. I know I ain't going to get a whole lot of amens on that because a lot of people don't think church is in that important. But here is David and he's forced out of Israel. He's forced out of the kingdom and he says it's like I'm in a dry place with no water and I'm longing to see your power and your glory so as I have seen it in the sanctuary. Are you hearing me? See, the reason I believe this was not during Saul's reign, I believe this was during Absalom's rebellion is because I believe by this time, by the time Absalom rebelled against David, David had already brought, brought the ark back to Jerusalem. It had been neglected in Saul's day. But David brought it back to Jerusalem. And what David did was he built a tent for it, not like uh, Moses' tabernacle that had two different compartments and it had an outer court and an inner court and then the holy place. He just built one Room, a one room tent and put it over the, the ark and then what he would do was he, he surrounded it with musicians tim, t uh, uh, cymbal players flute players harp players all the musicians he could get together hallelujah and he got singers and he, and he put it around them hallelujah and so David when David built his tabernacle his outer court hallelujah was, was not a fence. It was an outer court of praise. That's why he said, enter into his courts with thanksgiving. Come into his gates with praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And so David's sanctuary, David's tabernacle was surrounded with praise. And when you got around David's tabernacle, you heard music and you heard songs and you heard worship. And you saw people dancing. <laughs> and you saw people spinning. And you saw people shouting and shabaking and all of those Hebrew words we talked about uh, uh, during the revival on Friday night. Go back and listen to that. Hallelujah. And it was filled with praise. And every now and then what David would do was David would even leave up the tent, the, the, the garment on the tent so that he could peek in to where the ark was. And what David was, was longing for when he was banished here, not banished, but when he was forced into this wilderness, what he was longing for was those moments that he could go down to the tabernacle and the music would be going day and night and the singers would be singing and the worship would be going on and every now and then the glory of God would show up. And the cloud would fill the place. And every now and then David would, would even walk into that tent. Are you hearing me? He'd walk into that tent. And I believe every now and then he'd kneel down in front of that ark. Even in this psalm, you know, he said, I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings. You know what he was referring to there? The ark had cherubims on top of it. And they had wings. And every now and then, David would go down in there. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And when the sun would hit the ark just right, because he'd lift up the tent of the tabernacle, and he'd expose it to the sun. If the sun hit it just right, those wings would cast a shadow. And that's when he wrote Psalms 91. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> he who abides. In the, in the, in the, or he who dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. David was talking about going to church. <laughs> 
I know y'all don't believe it, but this is my message. Hallelujah. David was talking about going to church. And I know you think a pastor would preach a message like this. Well, yeah, this is, this is a pastoral message. David was missing church. He was missing going down to the sanctuary and getting into the glory of God. He was missing... <laughs> He was missing the presence of God being poured out. Anybody, anybody ever miss church when you can't be here? Oh, hallelujah. David's complaint in the wilderness was not that I'm in the wilderness, not that I don't have the comforts of my house, not that I don't have my throne. It was I can't go to church. Come on. Hallelujah. I'm missing time in the sanctuary. Church should not be a place that we feel obligated to come because it's Sunday. And when we get there, we hope they'll hurry up and get it over so I can get on with my life. No, church should be a place that you long for, that you can't wait to get to. And once it gets started, you don't want it to stop. Do I have any folks in this house that love church? But the reason this is not the case, the reason that this is not the case with many people, and many people don't have a longing to be in church, is because we don't go to the same church that David went to. David's church, David's church had the power and the glory. Woo, hallelujah. The reason people don't want to go to church today is because there is no power. And there is no glory in the church. David said, I want to see your power. I'm longing to see your power and your glory so as I have seen it in the sanctuary. David's saying, the church that I go to, both the power and the glory of God show up. Let me point out the difference of these two things. Hopefully, uh, you'll see that we need both of these things in our church. The glory is referring to the weight of God's presence. And the power is referring to the strength of God's presence. The glory is when God manifests his presence into the natural realm and you begin to feel it and you begin to experience it through your natural senses. Sometimes it looks like a cloud or a mist. Sometimes it feels like a heavy blanket laying on top of you and you can't move. Sometimes it feels like drunkenness and it makes you laugh and, and stumble. Sometimes you feel like you just want to sit in awe of it and not move an inch and, and not disturb it and never leave it. It manifests as the purest of love. It manifests as the, as the strongest, most filling joy you have ever experienced. It manifests as the most peace you've ever known in your life. It also manifests as boldness and authority. Whew. Then there's the power of God. That's, the, that's the, the strength of God. That's when we begin to see him move things and shift things in our life. The power of God is when cancer is dissolved right in the middle of church service. It's when diseases are healed. It's when mountains are moved while we're worshiping. It's, it's when demons are being ran off and, and refreshing is coming. It's, 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 it's the strength of God. And I've found that when the glory shows up, so does the power. Woo, hallelujah. And I found out that, that the power don't always come till the glory comes. That's why you don't just need to rebuke the devil. Sometimes you need to worship and pray in tongues and, and lift your hands and, and sing until the presence comes. Then bind the devil. Woo. It's the glory always brings the power. Notice David's heart here is not necessarily, let me get this. David's heart here is not necessarily, will you deliver me, God? But David's heart is early will I seek you. <laughs> and David's heart by saying this is this. My condition is not going to distract me from seeking you. Come on, I'm talking about conquering your wilderness. 
my condition is not going to distract me from seeking you. I've got a lot to be heard about, but early will I seek thee. I've got a lot to be upset about, but early will I seek thee. People have lied on me, turned their backs on me, but early will I seek thee. <laughs> People have stabbed me in the back. People I thought would never stab me in the back, but early will I seek thee. I'm in a cave. I'm not in my bedroom, but early will I seek thee. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. I'm in this hot, dry desert. I don't have the comforts of my well. I don't have the comforts of my servants bringing me food. Oh, hallelujah, but early will I seek thee. My own son wants to assassinate me, but ah, early woo, will I seek thee. In other words, my condition is not going to stop me from seeking you. But in the wilderness, if our condition doesn't distract us from seeking God in the sense that it causes us to just quit seeking him. Many times our condition will distract us in the sense that it becomes all that we talk about to God. Oh, hallelujah. But notice David's heart that when he says, I'm in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, he's not even talking about the natural conditions. He's talking about his spiritual condition. Are you hearing me? Because in the midst of the hell David was going through, David was more concerned with his spiritual condition than he was with his natural condition. Woo! <laughs> There's a word right there. What if we could get a generation that would seek God not to change their natural state but their spiritual state? Lord Jesus. Do you understand how unstoppable a generation would be if we were more concerned about our spiritual state than our natural state. Do you understand how much we would grow? Always being more concerned about our spiritual state than our natural state. You couldn't stop them coming from church to church. You couldn't shut them up worshiping. Nothing they go through would be able to turn them off from God. Because they're not really concerned about all of those natural things. They're concerned about where am I at with God. Woo. Oh, how powerful we'd be if when somebody left us, our immediate response would be early will I seek thee, not to fix the relationship, but I got to make sure I don't end up in loneliness and depression. Woo, come on somebody. Or when somebody talked about us, what if we say, Lord, I got to seek you not to cause them to understand me and heal the relationship, but I just don't want to end up in bitterness. Let them do whatever they want to do. I'm not worried about my natural condition. God, I want to be right in the spirit. What if we had a generation and something happened in the finances? They say, Lord, I got to seek you. Not to fix anything, <laughs> but just so I don't end up in fear and remind myself that you're a provider. Because here's what the Davids that conquer their wilderness knows. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Come on. And all of these things shall be added unto you. The Gentiles seek after natural things because that's the only way they know to get them. But my Father in heaven knows what I have need of. So I'm not worried about money. I'm not worried about friends. I'm not worried about my house. I'm not worried about my job. I'm not even worried about my health. I'm worried about God. Hallelujah. Are you going to speak to me today? Are you going to use me today? Come on, somebody. Am I walking in love? Am I, am I walking in your will, God? That's what I'm concerned about. You'll take care of all of these things. Somebody say amen. Woo. Hallelujah. Talking about conquering your wildernesses. Look at verse 3. He said, because thy loving kindness. Look at David's heart. In the wilderness, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. 
Look at this. This verse right here is why David could seek God in the wilderness with all hell breaking loose and long for his glory and power. This is why this verse right here. If you don't hear any other verse I preach today, hear this one. The rest of them are good. You don't want to miss them, but hear this one. The reason is because God's love was better to David than life. Oh, that's deep. Hallelujah. That's deep. Oh, this convicted me today. This convicted me when I was studying this. God's love was better to David than life. David didn't have much other love than God's love. He was shunned by his father and his brothers, put out in the shepherd's field hoping a lion and a bear would come and eat him. He wasn't invited to the anointing party when the prophet came to anoint one of Jesse's sons. Nobody thought he was worth anything. He was ashamed. He, he was, he was, they were ashamed of him. He was rejected. He was all alone. Oh, but God chose him. I don't want to get ahead of myself, and I'm just about to. But David didn't know love but God's love. And so there was nothing better to David than the love of this God that did what he did to him and for him. Here's the difference between many of us and David. People regard life as natural, but David regards God's great love as natural. In other words, as real as this natural life is, to many people, God's love is that real to David. God's love has got to be as real as this natural realm is to you, if not more. People enjoy life. David enjoyed God's love. People enjoy vacations and trips and, and, and toys and things they can buy. But David got his thrills from just the love of God. <laughs> He could be in the wilderness without any of the comforts of that wealthy palace. And he said, I'm good because <laughs> God loves me. <laughs> oh, people value life. David valued God's love. People, life is short. You can only live once. David didn't care about that. David said, I don't want nothing in this life. I got God's love, and that's eternal. People will sacrifice to live. David would sacrifice for God's love. People want to give life to others. David wanted to give God's love to others. People despair without a sense of life. David despaired without a sense of God's love. Remember when he sinned and he got rebuked? What was his cry? What was his prayer? God, don't take your spirit from me. I can't go on without you, Lord. I need your love. David had such an experience with God's love that it didn't matter what he went through. He was going to seek God. He was going to give God praise because he knew God loved him. I know that sounds simple, but I don't think we get it. Hallelujah. We say God loves us, but David had an unshakable revelation of God's love for him. So to David, life could get bad, but it didn't matter because the love of God, the love of God was better than life. Come on, somebody. Can you get a hold of it today that I know life can get bad, but God's love is better. Come on, somebody. You could go to sleep and lay your head on a gutter tonight because you don't have a home. But if you got God's love, you could lay down in peace and wake up in peace. This is love. <laughs> so when the love of God gets as real to you as it was to David, that's when you get free. I said, that's when you get free. That's when you get free from the burden of circumstances. When God's love becomes real to you. When it becomes so real, 
that you know that you know that you know every waking hour God's in love with me. His thought, David says stuff like his thoughts toward me are uncountable. I can't even count his thoughts towards me. Oh, hallelujah. And all my days, I am so precious to him that all my days were written down in a book before I was even born. He thought about me before anybody else ever thought about me. Before I was even conscious, he was thinking about me and writing down my days and writing down my exploits and writing down my successes. And he was, he wrote a whole book about me. I'm so precious to him. God Almighty, Jesus said, you're so precious to him, the hairs of your head are numbered. That doesn't just mean he knows the numbers of your hair. Each individual hair has its own number. So when 10 fell out, he knew it. When 15 fell out, he knew it. When 20 fell out, he knew it. Oh, God, hallelujah. Somebody shout, he loves me. Tell the person next to you, he really loves me. <laughs> You know that he loves you unconditionally. That's when you get free. That's when you get free from the burden of circumstance. Because you know no matter what's going on, God loves me. That's all I need to know. Woo, look at your neighbor and say, God loves me. <laughs> That's all I need to know. Woo. <laughs> I don't care. I, oh, God Almighty. Hallelujah. I ain't even worried about this election. I'll go vote and I'll do my thing, but I ain't even worried about it because God loves me. <laughs> I feel the Holy Ghost. I said I feel the Holy Ghost. Anybody feel the Holy Ghost in this house? I don't care what they do. Hallelujah. Le God Almighty, they can deflate it, inflate it. They can raise the prices, lower the prices. I don't care. God loves me. That's all that matters to me. I can shout today, not because the gas prices are low, but because God loves me. I can shout today, not because my president that I want's in the White House, because God loves me. Somebody lift your hands and give God a praise because he loves you. When you like David and you know God loves you. Woo! That's when you get free from people. I said that's when you get free from people. You remember when David danced before the Lord with all of his might? Huh? You remember when he did that? And he danced. Woo! And he was giving glory to God. And he got home. Woo! And his wife was mad. Huh? And his wife said to him in, in 2 Samuel 6, it says David returned to bless his household after he'd been out there dancing and worshiping the Lord, bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, his wife, came out to meet David and said, Oh, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of the servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. Evidently, he danced until all he had left on him was the ephod. Hallelujah. Danced his coat off. Hallelujah. Woo! And David said to Michael, watch this. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than thus. In other words, woman, you think this is crazy. You think I dance today. Oh, it's about to get more crazier and foolish than what you saw. Woo. Yeah. He said. <laughs> he said, it was before the Lord which chose me, before all of his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel, therefore I will play before the Lord, 
and I will be yet be more vile than thus and will be base in mine own sight. And of the maid servants which you've spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. They're going to honor me and respect me because I'm not worshiping for them to look at me. I'm worshiping for him. Here's what I want you to see that Michael, that, that, that caused him in this place to be free from the words of Michael, his wife. She didn't bother him because he said in verse 21, if they'll put verse 21 back up there, David said, it was before the Lord I danced. First of all, Michael, I wasn't dancing before you, nor was I dancing before the handmaids. I was dancing before the Lord. When you are scared to get up here and give God all of your praise with all of your might, I'm asking you, who are you dancing before? Who are you worshiping before? And who are you praising before? Because I don't know that anybody in this house, hallelujah, saved you, delivered you, healed you, set you free. I don't know why you're dancing before them anyway. You need to be dancing before the Lord. Then he said, then he said, this is why you don't bother me, Michael. This is why you don't bother me. Because I wasn't dancing before you or before any of those handmaids. I was dancing before the Lord. And then he said this, which chose me. In other words, Michael, the reason I danced like I danced and I'm going to get even crazier with my dance is because he loved me enough to choose me. <laughs> In other words, Michael, he loved me enough to send a prophet my way when I was a rejected little shepherd boy in my daddy's field and he pulled me out of obscurity and he anointed me above all of my brothers and he put me on this throne and he gave me the kingdom of his people. So excuse me, Michael. His love for me is better than your love for me because you didn't do for me what he did. I wish I could get a saved person in this house to help me in this place. Michael, you didn't die for me. You didn't call me out. You didn't deliver me. He did. So I'm going to dance all I want to dance. I'm going to worship all I want to worship. And so, Michael, whether me and you sleep in the same bed chamber tonight or not, <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. It don't bother me. Because his love, come on, is better than life. <laughs> oh, if you believe it, come on, give God a praise. Did he choose you? I said, did he choose anybody in this house? Come on, do I have anybody in this house that was worthless and useless and maybe on your way to hell, but he sent somebody your way, sent the word your way, sent the Holy Ghost your way, and chose you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, yes, I can make it through this wilderness. His love is better than life. And David said, thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Notice what he said here. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness or like eating a good steak. And my lips will praise you when I meditate on you, is what he's saying. David is saying... 
that meditating on the Lord's like eating a good steak. Like a good steak that's flavorful, that's satisfying. What do you do when you're eating a good steak? Well, you chew all the flavor out of it you can. What do you do when you're meditating on the word of God and it's blessing your life? You, you just chew on it and chew on it and think about it and think about it. And you just try to get every bit of goodness out of it you can. You try to get every 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 goose bump out of it you can. You try to get every shake out of it you can. You try to get every you try to just get every blessing out of it you can. And then what do you do when you get done eating that good steak that satisfied you? You sit back, you put your fork down, you sit back, you pat your, your big gut, hallelujah. And you and you wipe your lips, and you're like, whoa, that was good. You praise what you ate. Come on. You pray, oh, whoever cooked that, man, they can cook. Come on. Don't you do it? What do you do when you get done meditating on the good word of God? And it blesses you and it satisfies you right in the middle of your wilderness season. What do you do? You look up to heaven and you say, Lord, I can't, I can't help but give you some praise right now. That word that you just deposited into my spirit, oh, that was so good, God. you such a good cook, God. You cooked exactly what I needed in this season to get me through. Anybody believe God's a good cook in this house and he'll, he'll prepare what you need? when you need it. Has anybody ever been God through? God, 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 everybody. Oh, I can't even talk right now. Has anybody ever been brought through by uh, Jehovah Chef? Je Jehovah Chef, the cook, the Lord, that will prepare a revelation for you that will speak to you in your season. The Bible said there's nothing like a do word in a do season. Right word in the right season. You ever ate something but it didn't hit the spot? Because you didn't eat what God's cooked. When God cooks it, it hits the spot. Look at your neighbor and say, when God cooks it, it hits the spot. Woo! Woo! So understand that David said in verse 1, if you remember verse 1, put verse 1 back up there. Understand that David said in verse 1, my soul's thirsty for you, God, right? My soul is in a thirsty state. It's in a lacking state, in a place that's dry because I can't get to the sanctuary out here, right? But what does he say in verse 5 and 6 that we just read? He said, my soul that's thirsty shall be satisfied. Not because God's delivering me out of this wilderness. Come on, somebody. But because in the midst of the wilderness, I'm going to take my mind off of the circumstances and I'm going to put it on him. In other words, here's a revelation, and I want to help somebody with this. David's understanding was this. I don't have to be in the sanctuary or the comforts of my palace in order to be satisfied by the presence of the Lord. And I need to help somebody in this house, and I wish you'd help me, that if you're going to make it through the wilderness seasons of your life, you're going to have to learn how to be satisfied in the Lord without a church building, without a praise team, without a preacher. You're going to have to learn how to get in his presence wherever you're at. Somebody give him a praise if you believe God's not limited to the building. <laughs> Woo. Woo. Well, I'm preaching. I'm trying. Well, I'm trying anyway. Hallelujah. Woo. If I'm preaching good, say you're preaching good. If you want me to keep on preaching, say keep on preaching, white boy. Yeah, throw that white boy in there. Hallelujah. Woo! Shanda Bakai. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! In those seasons where you're seemingly forced into situations and circumstances out of your control, you're going to have to learn, like David, God's presence, God's glory, God's power is not limited to a comfortable church with an anointed man of God. But if I just put my mind on the Lord wherever I'm at, I can have church right there. 
That's why in the first line of this psalm, David wrote, in the middle of the wilderness, early will I seek thee. Come on. In other words, my circumstances are not going to stop me from going after you, God. He said early. Everybody say early. Early because he said, I'm going to start seeking you before my mind has time to focus on the hell I'm going through. Some of y'all ought to try seeking him early. Quit waiting till 3 o'clock in the afternoon until you've heard every bad report and you've met 20 negative people at work and you've done heard every bad news report and then, then you're going to try to lift your hands and pray. The devil is a liar. Wake up before you even hear any of that and go ahead and get your praise on, get your dance on, get the glow. I feel the Holy Ghost rising. My, I feel the Holy Ghost rising up in here. That means when I get up, the devil better watch out because I'm not going to meet him. I'm not going to meet him in defeat. I'm not going to meet him in depression. I'm going to meet him already having my praise on and know it. Oh, greater is he that's in me. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. Woo. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Hallelujah. shot up Oh, hallelujah. Understand that the boat can't sink unless the water gets inside. Oh, hallelujah. Let me say that again. The boat can't sink unless the water gets inside. Woo, Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saying to you, that I love to seek God in the comforts of a Holy Ghost filled church service where the anointing's flowing like today and everyone around me is going after the same thing. But I also know that I can seek him when everyone's gone <laughs> and I'm alone on my floor in the bedroom <laughs> and the same God that showed up in the church. Yeah. Have you ever had him show up? in the bedroom <laughs> late at night. Come on, do I got anybody that worships outside of church? It blesses me, honey. It blesses me. Seth, it blesses me. Austin, I feel like having a little church. Y'all might as well come and help me if you can. But it blesses me, church, to read about the God that showed up like a cloud in Solomon's temple when the singers became one voice praising God and the priests, they couldn't stand to minister because the glory filled the building and they fell on their face before God. Oh, that blesses me to know that we can come in here and sing with one voice until the glory shows up. But you know what also blesses me? It blesses to me to read uh, that when they threw three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace that there was a fourth man uh, that showed up in the fire and took the heat out of look at somebody say I'm gonna make it. <laughs> Come on prophesy to somebody tell them I'm gonna make it I'm gonna make it through this wilderness cause I know how to praise God in church and outside of church Woo. Uh, let me get a testimony brother Sean let me ask you something sitting back there with stitches in your knee and ice on your knee can God still touch you? Yes, he can. Come on, somebody. I don't have to have good, two good knees. I ain't got to have one good knee. I ain't even got to have knees. I got a God that'll show up no matter what situation I'm in. I dare somebody to give God a praise like you really know he loves you today. Get my dance track ready. I might start dancing. Hallelujah. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Anybody feel the Holy Ghost in this house? 
here's the thing. It blesses me to know that God will show up in a church service and fill the house with the cloud. But sometimes it blesses me more to know that he'll show up in a furnace. Because, look, can I be honest with y'all? I've had more furnaces in my life than I've had Holy Ghost filled church services. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I said, anybody know what I'm talking about? We're in here on Wednesday and Sunday, but you're walking through hell on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So thank God for a God that'll show up at church, but thank God for a God that'll show up in my fire. Come on, if you know the fourth man, give God a glorified praise. Give him a Shabbat. Jump, leap, clap your hands. Touch two people and tell them I'm going to make it out of this wilderness. I'm going to make it. 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 Yes, I am. I'm going to make it. 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 You know why you're going to make it? Because you're somebody that don't need Pastor Sean to have church. You don't need a praise team to have church. You don't need a dance track to have church. But you know how to have church all by. Yo, give him a praise if you can have church all by yourself. Woo. You might as well turn me up back there. Hallelujah. Just a little bit. Somebody look at somebody and say, hey, I can have church all by myself. I love you. Tell them I love you, but I don't need you to have church. I can have church in my bedroom. I can have church in my bathroom. I can have church in my car. I can have church on the side of the road. I can have church in the bathroom at work. I can have church wherever I'm at. I can have church in the hospital. I can have church in the doctor's office. I yeah! Oh, come on! Well, 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 somebody say yes, yes. <laughs> See, David said in verse 7, Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I don't know if I can got the strength to preach this or not, but he said, because you've been my help. <laughs> right, watch this, watch this. Well, Dave, I got to say this, and then I'm, I, gotta, I, got, I, got, uh, uh, I got a prophetic word. I got a couple prophetic words I got to leave you with, but I got to say this first, Lisa. I got to say this first. <laughs> And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. I could preach. I could preach the rest of the day on this. But, but David said, while he's in this wilderness, watch this. While I'm in this wilderness, circumstances are out of my control. My church routine's been messed up. And the, and the glory and the power of God, I, I can't get down to the sanctuary. What, watch what he says. Watch what he says. Because thou hast been mine help, <clears throat> therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. In other words, David says, I'm going to rejoice in this wilderness season because you have been. Y'all ain't getting it. Y'all ain't getting it. You have been my help. Can I help somebody in this house? If you're going to make it through the wilderness seasons of your life, you're going to have to have a history with God. Is there anybody in this house that says, Pastor, I got a history? Y'all, y'all, come on. Am I in the right church that I got a history with God? I've seen God move. I've seen God heal me. I've seen God deliver me. I've seen God show up. And because he's been my help, I will, come on, rejoice. In other words, Lisa, I'm not 
not going to lose my praise in this wilderness because I got a history with God. I've seen God move. I've seen God heal. I've seen God deliver. And he's done too much in my life for me to give up now. So I'm not losing my praise because I know this God that's been in my life. He's the same God today that he was yesterday. And he'll still be that God tomorrow. So I'm going to rejoice. Somebody rejoice if you got a history with God. somebody and say if he did it before he'll do it again he'll do it again touch somebody find somebody that you thought was depressed today hallelujah and say hey 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 if he did it before he'll do it again I didn't mean to offend nobody I'm sorry if they're coming to you but maybe next time you'll come in with thanksgiving and you'll come in with praise come on if you got a history with God get on your feet for about the next 15 seconds and give God a Shabbat give him a Hallel give him a Gil Give him something. Come on. Ten. Nine. Come on. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. <laughs> he'll do it again. He'll do it again. I said he'll do it again. got a history with God. <laughs> you know, people, uh, they call people um, repeat offenders. God's a repeat healer. He's a repeat deliverer. He's a repeat chain breaker. He's a repeat yoke destroyer. He never runs out of power. He never runs out of enough. He never runs out of the love uh, that it requires for him to do what he did for you back then. Uh, he don't love you any less today uh, than he did back then. Uh, somebody shout it one more time. He'll do it again. I believe, in other words, David was saying, I've been in this wilderness before. <laughs> I know what it is. I know what it is to seek God in the middle of a cave and say, God, I'm in the middle of a cave, but this ain't my refuge. You're my refuge. You're my rock. You're my high tower. You're the reason I'm going to go to sleep tonight and I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm still going to be alive. I've been here before, God, and what you brought me through when Saul was chasing me, you go Gonna bring me through even with my sons chasing me. Ah, give him praise if you got a history. Some of you need to have an aha moment right now. Which is which is this. Which is you getting up going, wait a minute, wait a minute, I just had spiritual amnesia for a moment, I've been here before, and I've come out, what am I so worried about, if he did it before, I gotta move on, I, I gotta move on, but I can't help it, somebody needs to hear it one more time, if he did it before, He'll do it again.
slap somebody a high five and tell him he'll do it again. He'll do it again. He'll, he'll do it again. All right, sit down, sit down. Sit down. I preached enough on that. Hallelujah. Woo! Woo! Uh, somebody say, I've been here before. <laughs> somebody say, just like I came out then, I'll come out now. Hallelujah. Let me say this. I got I to gotta say this. I got to give you these prophetic words. Woo! Is anybody ready for this? Can you handle this? All right. Hallelujah. If not, I can close. But if you can handle it, hallelujah, I won't close yet. Hallelujah. This psalm was written during Absalom's rebellion, I believe. So there's something interesting I found out that I believe is a word for somebody's wilderness season. I was looking at how God turned this wilderness season around for David. I, I looked at how God put down Adam's rebellion. And here's what I discovered. <laughs> Woo. And I believe it's a word for somebody. This rebellion culminated in a civil war. Those that Absalom had turned against David and those that were still with David went to war with one another. But I want you to look at what 2 Samuel 18 says about when Absalom was killed. And I believe this is a word for us corporately and individually. In 2 Samuel 18, verse 9, they're in the middle of this battle, and Absalom is, is running from some of David's men. And it says, Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under a thick uh, went under the thick boughs of a great oak. Watch this, and his head caught hold of the oak. And he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. Woo, hallelujah. Watch this. Notice that Absalom that caused all this mess in this wilderness season for David. Watch this. He's now suspended in a tree. And the text said, and what caught my attention was what the text says. He is caught between heaven and earth. I don't know if you know how the demonic realm works or not, but let me just help you real quick without doing a, an extensive long teaching. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that Satan is the prince of the air. That word air is translated atmosphere. Satan is the ruler, the prince of the atmosphere above us. Satan and his kingdom, his demons, they hang out in the atmosphere above us. You could call it the heavens, whoo, God Almighty, and he rules that atmosphere, and he has delegated authority, and I'm not trying to go into a big demonology teaching, but Satan and his demons hang out there, but then there are demons that are like foot soldiers, and they're assigned to attack us, and they're sent from the atmosphere by, by the head uh, fallen angel himself, uh, Satan, uh, and also by his, their general demons that are in the atmosphere. And those demons will assign what I call foot soldier demons who descend from the atmosphere and they come down into the earth and they're there with an assignment to attack God's people and to cause us to come into this wilderness seasons that we're preaching about today. God Almighty. And when it said Absalom was caught by the oak between heaven and earth, I could hear the Lord saying, Sean, tell the people that I'm about to suspend the enemy. Oh, I wish I could get a shout. I'm about to suspend the enemy between heaven and earth. In other words, that devil that's on his way to wreak havoc is going to get stopped right in the middle. If you believe it, give God a shout. Praise. In other words, the assignment that he's coming to the earth to carry out in your life. 
he's not going to make it to the earth to carry it out. Let me remind you of something, and then I'll give you this last prophetic word, and I'll, we'll get out of here. Do you remember what I told you about praise the other night? David said in Psalms 8 and 2, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings how thou hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemy, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. And Jesus said, when quoting that in Matthew 21, 16, he says, Have you ever read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou perfected praise? If you put Jesus' translation into David's verse, you find that it said, reads like this. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou or uh, 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 perfected praise because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy. Praise stills. Y'all didn't catch me. Hallelujah. I said praise stills. Do you want to suspend the devil between heaven and earth and cut him off from your house? Cut him off from what he's trying to do? Your praise. Come on, somebody. Your praise. He's coming after you, but your praise. He's going to attack your children, but your praise. He's trying to get his hands on your finances, but you'll pray. Could it be, Mark, that David not allowing the wilderness could distract him from seeking God? Could it be that when David said, I'll meditate on you in the night watches, and my lips will praise you. And when he says, you've been my help. I got a history with you, God. I will rejoice. Do you know what those two forms of praises are? One of them is Shabbat. David said, in this wilderness, I'm going to shout. Come on, somebody give God a Shabbat. I may not get much help on this, but the other praise is the word Hallel. You know what Hallel is? That's a crazy praise. Anybody got a crazy praise? Give them a crazy praise. Shaprataya. Here's what I want to say. Could it be that what caught Absalom in that oak tree and suspended him from heaven and between heaven and earth, could it be the Shabbat? Could it be the Hallel that David gave in the wilderness? I'm telling you, if you got a praise in the wilderness, God's going to suspend your enemy. Making your work today, Stephen. I apologize. Hallelujah. And there's Absalom. He's suspended between heaven and earth. And David's over there, Shabaka, and Hallelin. And Absalom's getting hung in a tree. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I wish you'd see the devil getting hung in a tree every time you praise him. Every time you praise God, just see the devil getting caught in a tree. Come on, somebody. Come on. Hallelujah. Yeah, go ahead and laugh at the devil. He deserves it. Hallelujah. He's put you through hell, but you ain't lost your praise. You ain't lost your praise. He can feel it right now. He can feel your praise right now. He can feel it shaking his work. He can feel it crumbling his kingdom. I'm going to step out of my ordinary character, and I'm going to give you this word. I don't usually do this. I'm not, I try not to be weird, but I'm going to be weird this morning. 
Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor, is going to be weird. All right, are you ready? Um, let me, can I, because I looked at how Absalom got killed and, it, and, it, and the Lord gave me a word. Watch this. Absalom suspended in the tree. But look how he got killed. And I'm, this is a word for somebody. 2 Samuel 18 and 14 and 15. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. He took three darts in his hand. Everybody say three. He took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Whew. Oh, my God. I'm hearing, I'm hearing things while I'm talking. Hallelujah. And then it says, verse 15, 10, 10. Everybody say 10. Ten young men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. Absalom was killed with three darts or knives and by ten men. Everybody say three and ten. I don't look much into the Hebrew numerology, but it is a thing. And it does mean some things to us. And I looked at the Hebrew numerology of the number three and... It means divine fullness, completeness, or perfection. In other words, the Lord spoke to me woo, and said, Sean, I brought divine completeness to the season of Absalom. Y'all ready to go home tonight, aren't you? I'm sorry. You shouted too much. Okay. Now, watch it. God, Sean, I brought divine completeness. In other words, this season of rebellion of Absalom, I brought it to a completion. And the Lord wants me to speak to somebody in this house that what I'm about to do through your praise in this wilderness season is I'm about to suspend the enemy and while I got him suspended I'm going to go ahead and complete the rebellion of hell against what God is trying to do if you can't shout about nothing else shout about that baby it's coming to an end somebody shout it's coming to an end But here's the other thing, and get my dance track ready. I'm on dance just a little bit. Hallelujah. You got it turned up? Turn it all the way up. Hallelujah. I'm on dance a little bit on this one. I feel the Holy Ghost. Because the number 10 is very interesting. Because the number 10 means law and order. There were 10 commandments, which was the law of God, but it brought order it brought God's order to mankind. Understand that when Absalom was killed by ten men, God reestablished the order of the kingdom and said, now my man is going to get back on the throne and order's coming back to the kingdom. God said, get ready. I'm not only going to suspend your enemy and bring an end to the rebellion, but I'm going to reestablish my order in your house. Now give me my dance track. Somebody help me dance. Somebody shout, put it back in order, God. Is anybody ready for God's order to come back in your life?
Order's coming back. Order's coming back. Order's coming back. I feel the Holy Ghost. You've been going through a wilderness season. Things have been got out of order in your finances, in your health, in your marriage. But God said, get ready. I'm putting it back in order. Now, I dare you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, get up front, and give God a praise before we get out of this house. Don't act like this ain't your church. If this is your church, get out of your seat and praise him. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I hope this word blessed you today. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, God, to move every mountain in the believer's life that's listening today. I'm asking you, Lord God, to heal, to deliver, to touch and to set free, Father. Restore those that need restoring and renew those that need renewing, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. For those of you today that want to receive Jesus into your heart, pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again on the third day. And I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. If you prayed that prayer with me, Get in contact with us. Look, uh, look us up on Facebook. Look us up on, on the web. Uh, email us. Get a hold of us because we want to minister to you and make sure we can help you uh, further along your walk with Jesus. Until next time, be blessed.